Good evening. How's everybody doing? Good? Good. I'm sure you all saw the report today about the abortion uh, that the Senate tried to, the Democrats tried to push through um, a law um, that abortion that couldn't be turned overturned, the Roe versus Wade couldn't be overturned, and it was shot down. Thank God for that. Um, of course, then the, uh, they said that uh, the reason they got shot down was because the Republicans don't care about women, which is a lie. Um, we care about women, right? We care about women. We just care about women before they get pregnant, not just after they get pregnant. So... <laughs> Right. <clears throat> so, so um, continue to pray for that whole ordeal. We're going to look at your prayer sheet first. Um, please add on your prayer sheet Stephen Hopkins. Stephen Hopkins. Stephen Hopkins. Um, he's been on there before. Hopkins. Yeah. Um, this is Polly's cousin, um, and he um, tried to commit suicide. Um, but his father, Stephen, caught him before, Steve caught him before he did. So um, just remember them in your prayers. Um, and I don't think she put her on here, but um, Vicki, what's Kelly's mom's last name? McCord. Vicki McCord. Um, is sick. Um, so remember Vicki in your prayers. Yes. Right. And he's been asking for years because he's been in, in and out of um, alcoholic. Uh, um, he's an alcoholic and he's been in and out of places asking for help and so yeah continue to pray for him other Vicky other praises updates prayer requests yes ma'am okay Okay, that's good. Phyllis Deem. I knew that. I was just asking. Deem. She's on the list. Halfway, quarter. Uh, that's her sister, Phyllis Deem. Her mother is Shirley Lewis. She's all the way down, fourth one from the bottom. And I just saw Malia's name on here, and I got a text today that she was coming home today. So, yeah, it's hard on me. All right, what else? Yes, ma'am. You know her last name? Lisa Martin. She's in rehab. For... for she had kidney dialysis. I know a kidney nurse that can help her. I know a kidney nurse that might be able to help her. 
She's related to those two people that are dressed alike. How long y'all been married? Fifty-five years, you start dressing alike. <laughs> she dressed him so he looks good. <laughs> All right, what else? We're having too much fun in here. What shots? something that just came up for on you like in the last like since you retired <laughs> now nah, as he, yeah since you were 16 wow All right, what else? Jacob Harper. Say it again. Lou Gehrig's. Okay. He's twenty four. Okay. Harper. And he's getting some shots. Okay. Anything else? Matt, you doing all right? All right. All right. She's still t taking victims. Charlie. else let's go ahead and pray silently and we'll close a few moments
God, you are so good to us. You give us life. You give us a purpose. Lord, you've called us to live out life for you. And so, Father, we praise you for who you are. Praise you for the goodness and the grace that you show to us every single day. And I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. Lord, we would be in such a mess if it wasn't for your grace and your mercy. And so, Father, we thank you for it. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for these many requests that have been made tonight, <clears throat> the good things we've heard, um, for Shirley uh, Lewis doing better, and um, Malia, and uh, Phyllis Deem, and, and jo Lord, we just lift them to you, and we thank you for them. We pray for complete recovery for Perry, that the shots would help him. Um, Lord, we pray that you give the doctors wisdom. Um, Lord, may they seek you, and Lord, we thank you for it. We pray for Jacob Harper um, and the good results he's getting. Lord, we continue to pray for him and pray, Father, that you would um, just use him for your glory and your honor. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for what you're doing. Lord, we continue to pray for our, 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 our church, um, for ourselves, first of all, for our church, for our area. Lord, that uh, we would just keep our eyes on you, put our eyes on you, and let, let you lead and, 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 and be real and, and submit to your authority and your leading. Uh, Father, we thank you for that. We pray for our country, that our leaders would do the same. That they would turn to you if they don't know you, and if they do, that they would stand for truth. And through it all, Father, that you would be honored and glorified. Uh, Father, we thank you for your love. We pray for our military. We pray for protection for them. We thank you for them. Uh, Lord, we pray for um, just our missionaries all over the world um, and believers all over the world, Lord, that uh, you would just use them to glorify you and lift you on high. Uh, Lord, we thank you for them. We thank you for your love, and we thank you for your, your mercy and grace. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. All right, we are in Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. It was with the rest of your books. If it was, if it was with the rest of your books. Um. So here's our outline. We've been going over Luke's um, introduction, and then events relating to the Savior's coming. Um, and then events relating to the Savior's career, and events relating to the Savior's. Career. There we are. Uh, cross will be last. Okay, Charlie's quick tonight. Um, so go ahead. The work in Galilee. Go ahead, Charlie. Uh, the work is c commenced. It's criticized and it's climaxed. And we saw a dependent and a dynamic Savior. Um, and then um, we are going to start in um, dynamic in a, a di dependent Savior, a dynamic Savior, and now we're going to start dynamic in his words and then di dynamic in his works is what we're going to talk about tonight um, in chapter 7. So let's read the first 10 verses, then I want to come back and, and look at it. He says, Now when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum, and a um, certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when he came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the, the one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. And Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to you, go. And he goes, and do another come, and he comes, and to my servant do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well who had been sick. All right, so first thing we want to look at as we look at this is Dr. Luke shows us that Jesus is triumphant over all. Okay, so that's the, that's the theme of this 10 verses. Jesus is triumphant over all. 
The first thing is that distance could not hinder him. Um, and the first thing we want to see is the setting. The setting. Look at verse 1 and tell me where this is. Capernaum. What do we know about Capernaum? Cotton has been there. Maybe it would help if we could see it on a map. Charlie, if you go to the next slide, please. There you go. All right, so it's northern part of the Sea of Galilee, right? Uh, Capernaum is where Jesus would make his home. Whose home would he stay in? Who? Peter's. He stayed in Peter's, all right? Uh, Capernaum is the area where he would perform most of his miracles, he healed a noble man's son. He healed a demo demoniac in the synagogue. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. Um, he healed a paralytic. He healed a woman with uh, constant he hemorrhage. Um, he raised the daughter of, of Jairus there. Um, and he healed numerous others. Okay? Um, no, no, it's a little bit off from there. But... Uh, Capernaum is one, uh, is one of the lake's small bays. It was a path of sudden storms that lashed out, so the storms would come through Capernaum, down through the bay. Um, from that, that place, Capernaum, on the seashore, you could look across and see the 12 miles. You could see the, uh, the length of that, um, as well as a half dozen miles to the other side where the feeding of the 5,000 would have taken place. Okay? Um, uh, Two miles away would have been um, where the River Jordan would have flowed into the lake. Um, and further north was this, the uh, Mount Hermon. So you could see Mount Hermon. Um, Mount Hermon is the, the place in Israel that most of the time during the year has snow on it. Um, a Roman garrison, um, an important customs house was located in this town. Uh, there was a synagogue in this town. Jesus once described this town as being exalted up to heaven. Um, this is where Peter lived, and Andrew, and John, and James, and one other disciple that we know of for sure. Matthew. 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 You should have gotten that one, Matthew. All right, verse two. We taught. We see the soldier in verse two, um, two through eight. Actually, um, in the Gospels in the Book of Acts, we meet a number of centurion. All of them honorably mention um, the pagan world was filled with the wreckage of its moral institutions. The Roman army was one of the few such institutions left in which some of the old virtues still survived. Uh, there were still many men in the Roman army just like any army that are evil um, and, and selfish men. Um, but this centurion seemed to be a man that was born a heathen, uh, but he had strong leanings toward Judaism. Many uh, Gentiles were completely disillusioned with the shallowness, immorality, and spiritual bankruptcy of pagan religions. Um, there were many, many gods that the, the Romans thought would help them. And to many of the Romans, when they would conquer a land, they would also conquer their gods. Um, and if they felt that those gods were worthy to be worshipped, they would worship them. Um, and this man felt like there was something different about Judaism. Um, they, they did not like one thing that the Jews wanted them to, to have if they wanted to become a Jew. And that would have been what? What would they not have liked to have done? Say it again. Circumcision, right? Um, they wouldn't have liked that, and they held out against the dietary law. Why? Because as everybody knows, everybody likes bacon. Amen? Um, uh, so look at verse 2. Uh, this cent certain centurion's servant who was dear to him, was sick, 
<clears throat> and ready to die. So he heard about Jesus. He sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they begged him, saying that the one, I begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has done what for us? Build us a synagogue, all right? So this guy's a good dude, okay, according to the Jews, all right? How, what are they judging him on? His works. They're judging him on his works. Look what he has done for us, Jesus. He cares about us, okay? So uh, verse 6, Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, a centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. All right, so the first thing we see is that he, uh, that the Jewish elders, the Jewish, he, he, he asked them to go to Jesus because as a pagan man, as a Gentile, he does not feel led that he should go to them. Also, he is a soldier, so he doesn't feel like he should go to Jesus, um, but he asks and appeals to the Jewish elders. <coughs> now, in verse 6, <coughs> what do we see that, that happens in verse 6? What, what do we see that his response is? Okay. So the key phrase, is, phrase in that is not worthy. Okay? How do the Jews see him? He's worthy. He's done all these works. He's done all these things for us. How does he see himself? I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of you. Okay? Um, he's not very far from the centurion's house, and he gets this message. I'm not worthy. We look at verse 7. Uh, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Um, so that statement, I'm not worthy, is a very remarkable statement, and is the, the first place that a person needs to come to before salvation. Before salvation, he has to come to the point where he says, I'm not worthy. I'm guilty. Okay? I'm guilty. Um, I'm not worthy. And, and evidently, this man is now having some second thoughts um, he, about sending the get delegation to plead his cause. Um, they, would please, they would plead for him, but he says, I'm not worthy. And what that tells us is nobody can approach God on their good works. Nobody can come to God on their personal merits. Okay? Um, and so, but instead, what does he say? What, is the, what does the man say? Just do what? Just say the word. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. In other words, distance has no obstacle, Jesus I'm not worthy of, of you coming to my house, but I believe that your word can heal. And what is Jesus' response to that? Verse 9. He marveled. Why? Because this man had what? Had faith. What saves? The grace of God through faith. Right? Um, and so what we see... Here, it's three estimates of the uh, Gentile Roman soldiers. Uh, he's, the Jewish authorities say he's worthy. He says, I'm not worthy. And Jesus said, I've not found so great a faith in all of Israel. Yeah. That's right. That's right good point okay um, which brings us to verse 10 which is the sequel and uh, those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick now um, I think it's in the King James it says found the servant whole is that right it says whole okay that's a, that's a medical term and it literally means they found him to be in good health in good health. Um, the man moment before had been on death's door. 
And now, he's all well, okay? Um, 100% well. Um, it's, a, it's a remarkable cure. Uh, Paul later declared that neither height nor depth can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, so then distance couldn't hinder him. Luke now is going to show us that death could not thwart him or stop him. Look at verse 11. Three times, three times Jesus um, goes to a funeral and the fu he breaks up the funeral. Right? A 12-year-old little girl, she died. He tells her to w wake up, arise, and she does. Right? This man that he's about to heal, and who's the third one? Lazarus. He tells him to come forth three times. So Jesus would be a good guy to invite to your funeral. Right? But let's look at this. Uh, look at the Lord's coming, verse 11 and 12. Verse 11. Now it happened the day after that he went in, into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and a large, large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the city was with her. Okay. Charlie, if you'll go back and put up that um, map for us, please. All right, so you see where Capernaum is, right? Everybody with me at Capernaum? All right, you're going to come down and over to your left, right? And you see Nain way down there. Nain was about a good day's journey from Capernaum. So they've, they're making this walk all in one day, all right? Um, it's, it, I know it looks like a long way. But it's really only about two dozen miles from Capernaum. So two dozen miles is about from here to the other side of Barbersville. So if we got, if we got started tonight, could we make it by like tomorrow? <laughs> right? Uh, y you also have to think that, yes, they had roads, but they weren't paved. Um, and they would have been rocky, um, hard to walk on, but they made it. Um, the interesting thing about Nain, he would have gotten there late, late afternoon. Jesus and his followers arrived there. The road came from the northeast by way of a town called Indor. Why is that name familiar to you? Saul went to the witch at Indor. Okay, so he would have went through, uh, through Indor. To the west were the hills beyond which lay, lay his home of Nazareth. To the south was Shunem and the famous plain of Jezreel. So every direction that he, he went when he got, he could have went when he got there, every direction was full of biblical history, Old Testament history. Um, Luke mentions the crowd. Some from Capernaum probably followed with him. Um, as they approached the gate of the city, they met a funeral procession coming out of Nain. The widow would have rent, rented her upper garment, which was a custom. Uh, the, the young man's corpse would have been washed, anointed, and wrapped in a shroud. Um, the widow would have secured the services of a couple of flute players and an official mourner as custom required. Um, they would have gone and wailed some words like, alas for the lion, alas for the hero. Um, the body would have been placed in an open coffin, probably with the face covered. Neighbors and friends in bare feet would have taken turns carrying the coffin, making frequent stops so that as many people as possible could share in the task. You've all seen the... the the, the um, in the Middle East where they have the coffins and they have a big crowd and they just kind of pass it overhead. Okay, it's kind of like that idea, but these people would have actually stopped and carried it. But um, there would have been a lot of people crying and weeping, um, and behind the coffin would have walked his relatives and friends. So that procession met the other procession going the other way, the one procession would have been led by the angel of death, 
The other procession was led by the angel of life. And when the two groups met, the angel of life overcame the angel of death. Custom decreed that the funeral procession be given right away and that the others join in the journey to the grave. By the way, if you've ever come across a funeral procession that's going by you in a car and you don't pull over, I'm going to come after you. Show some respect for the dead, please, for the family. Yeah, a lot of people don't know it's a courtesy. Yeah, I was in, a, I was in one, I want to say, I think it was here. I won't tell you which funeral home, but um, we pulled, I was riding with the funeral home director, which I usually don't do, but I did this time, and uh, for some reason, and pulled around a corner, and this kid, other kid came flying through in a car and cut in the processional line, and he threw on his brakes, stopped right in the middle of the road, and made the kid, and he got out and chewed him out, and I was like, All right, moving on. (laughs) Glad it wasn't me. Um, Look at uh, verse 13 to 15. We see Jesus' compassion. Um, When Jesus saw the widow, his heart goes out to her. Verse 13, uh, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, don't weep. Now, For one of us to tell someone who's just lost a loved one, don't weep, would have seemed like uncaring and flippant, right? But Jesus was about to do something for her. And one word from him and distance could be abolished. Look at verse 14. He came and he touched the open coffin. And those who carried him stood still. All right, why? Why? What's wrong with what he just did? You don't touch a dead body, especially if you are a considered to be a, not just a Jew, a, a priest, okay, a rabbi. You don't touch a dead body. You, you, remember, the, you remember the story uh, of um, the Good Samaritan, and the priest comes upon this person, and he doesn't what? He doesn't touch him. Why? Because he would be unclean. So Jesus stops this processional, right? And he goes to the coffin, and he touches this dead man, all right? And then he says to him, young man, I say to you, do what? Arise. (laughs) Arise. To Jairus' daughter, he said, damsel, I say to you, arise. To this young man, he says, young man, I say to you, arise. To Lazarus, he says, Lazarus, come forth. Verse 15, so he was, so he who was dead sat up and began to do what? So we talked about the, the, uh, the story about Saw, right, and the witch, right? So what did Saul want her to do? First of all, it was, it was completely against the law of God for him to do this, okay? Um, it, he was breaking the, breaking the law. He was going to a witch, okay? They were supposed to be banned from Israel anyway. So he goes to her, but why? W- what was the purpose of him going to her? Yes, he wanted to bring back Samuel from the dead, Okay? He wanted to get the blessing of God. And he wasn't hearing from God. So he goes to a witch and he asked her to bring back Samuel so Samuel could bless him before he was going to go to battle. Okay? Is this not crazy? Right? So this witch who supposedly has tried to bring people back before now tries to bring back Samuel. And when Samuel shows up, what does she do? She freaks out. Ah! Right? Don't want to say it too loud. Ken's got new ears. She freaks out. Why? Because this wasn't, this was a real person. 
she was used to speaking to demons. Now, a real person comes back and speaks, and she freaks out. Now, why do I say that? Because here is this person being raised in Nain, right around the corner from the ancient village of Endor. Uh, people who tamper with spiritism imagine that they're talking with departed loved ones when they're really talking to demons. They're evil spirits. And anything associated with spiritism is from the devil. Right? So look at the Lord's company in verse 16, 17. The end of verse 15, he says, he was dead and sat up and began to speak and he presented himself to his mother. Then fear came upon all upon all and they glorified God saying a great prophet has arisen up among us and God has visited his people and this report went uh, uh, this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region okay so possibly the Lord had this incident in mind when he came past Endor on his way to Nain he's going to do what uh, no witch or no medium um, could do and can do he was going to speak to a dead person. And that's what he did. Um, and he spoke to him as though he were right there. News of this miracle spreads far and wide. Okay? Um, immediately, they start saying something. What do they say, first of all, about him? After they glorify God, what do they say about him? Okay, he's a great prophet. They were partly right. Because he was more than a prophet, right? Um, and could you imagine if you were at Capernaum and you decided to take this 24-mile hike with Jesus and you got down there and Jesus goes to the first thing and he goes to a funeral and the guy sits up in the coffin and starts talking. Is that not worth the 24-mile the, 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 the walk? The walk? What a miracle, right? Those who saw it probably were still talking about it when Luke came to do his research for this book. Yeah. Exactly. So look at verse 17, though. Where else does this report go? What's part of Judea? What city is part of Judea? Let me put it that way. Say it again. Jerusalem. Who do you think heard about this? The Pharisees, the Sadducees. Right? They would have all heard about this great thing that happened to, to them. 18 through 35, we see he's dynamic in his ways, perfecting John's faith. Um, verse 18 through 23. John the Baptist, where was he? at this point in time? Yes, he was. He was in prison. Okay, he was languishing in Herod's prison for daring to do what? What did he say? What, did they, what, what put him in prison? No. Tearing Herod that he was wrong for taking his brother's wife. That's why John the Baptist was in prison. Um, and so he is in the fortress Macarus, um, which is a castle over, over, over top of a, a town and countryside. Had massive walls, um, and, and it had a very deep dungeon, and that's where he had been. Um, it's been a year and a half since Jesus has come on the scene, and he baptized Jesus and said, here's somebody who's... Sandals, I'm not worthy to unlace. Um, he's the promised Messiah. It's been a year and a half, 18 months, but according to John and his belief, nothing has changed. The, Roman, uh, the Romans are still in control of the country. Corruption is, is still in the court. The temple has remained unchanged. Um, the Herods are still triumphing. The hip hypocritical scribes and Pharisees are still in their seats in the, in the synagogue, and the Sadducees still 
spread their unbelief. So John is discouraged. And maybe he thought he had made a mistake. Perhaps Jesus was not the Messiah. So look at verse 18. Verse 18, the disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things. So the disciples are able to go in, of John are able to go, not the disciples of Jesus, but John's followers are able to go in and talk to him and tell him, look, this is what's going on. This is what Jesus is doing. Um, and then look at verse 19 through 20. John called two of his disciples and sent them to Jesus and said, Are you the coming one? Are you the Messiah? Or do we look for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And Dr. Luke tells us uh, that they've come at a great time. Look at verse 21. And that very hour, so they come to Jesus. In that very hour, Jesus cured many infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many blind, he gave sight. And the key word in that verse is the word many, many. Uh, the people came in droves. The word for um, infirmities is a chronic disease. All right, um, they're, they're, they brought their um, afflictions. The word for that is plagues or acute sicknesses. Um, and so he's using some medical terms once again. Um, he, he, and what does he do to all of them? He heals every single one of them. And people who were possessed by evil spirits, he healed them. That word for evil used to describe the demons carries the idea of malignant evil that causes pain and sorrow. When you use that same word evil as a noun talking about someone, it's talking about Satan, the evil one. All right? So evil spirits evil spirits seem to have infested Israel during Jesus' day. Um it's as if Satan has realized who's here, and he's trying to attack the people with the evil spirits as much as possible during that time. And so you see an outpouring of the evil spirits. Whenever you see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God, you will also see a replica of evil spirits being outpoured at the same time. Um, that, that kind of thing will be seen in the last days. Um, you can read about that on your own in 2 Thessalonians 2. And it is becoming even more characteristic in our day. Um, there are evil spirits. Um, it's, it seems like they're everywhere. The thing is, the demons, the evil spirits, are no match for Jesus. They weren't then, and they're not today. Jesus is on the throne, and they will answer to him. Um, verse 22 and tw 23, uh, John's disciples are going to carry back um, an answer to John. In verse 22 and th 23, Jesus said, Go and tell John the things you've seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. What does Jesus say? He said, who can do this? Who can do this? And did any of the other prophets do all these things? No, they didn't. He said, I'm doing these. You go back and tell Jesus, you go back and tell John that I am God in the flesh. And that's his message for him. And that's our message that we are to tell people that Jesus is God in the flesh. We could go on and talk about 24 through 35, but I'll say that for next week. That's really good stuff, too. It's all good stuff. Yeah.
have to, right? Yeah, well. Look, Jesus wasn't impressed by the crowds. He wasn't in this for a popularity contest. Um, he was in this for one reason and one reason only. He knew what was going to happen to John. Um, he knew that he was going to be murdered. He knew that he was going to be murdered. But he knew that there was a purpose and a reason for everything. And in our lives, there's a purpose and a reason for everything. We may not understand it. But ours is not to understand. Ours is to trust and obey. Right? Trust and obey. Father, help us as we walk with you to trust you and obey. Lord, you are such a great God. You love us so much. You are so powerful and awesome. And Father, we've seen you today heal the dead, raise them from the raise people from the dead, healing other people, Lord. We've read about it. Lord, we know that you are still a God who loves us so much. And so I pray, Father, that you would um, heal the dead spiritually, uh, that you would open eyes and hearts to you. And, Father, that you would heal those who are brokenhearted, even as that widow, uh, widow of that young boy and that mother was, Lord. You loved her and you had compassion on her. And, Father, may we do the same to people that are hurting in our world today. May we show the love of Jesus to them. Thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it's true. And Lord, now we just pray that as we go out, we'd be reminded that we're going into a mission field of people who need to hear um, and see Jesus. And Lord, we give you the praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. All right. Don't forget Sunday morning. Not this Sunday. Next Sunday is the sing and dance time of the preschool um and so just like we did before um when they were here for christmas if we can sit on the sides and let the parents and the grandparents have the chosen seats um but <clears throat> that'll be on the 22nd so